シーが入れ替わってたんだはあこれってもしかして本当に私夢の中であの男の子と俺は夢の中であの女と<笑>入れ替わってる Body swapping. Literally, body swapping is just the swapping of souls, personalities, or psyches between two or more characters. Within anime and manga, the focus of this video, body swapping is usually done within a supernatural or religious context, though occasionally science fiction. The religious context, when it's used, is usually Shinto, though more on that a bit later. Numerous tropes are employed within body swapping narratives, but self serving is a larger, sort of overarching trope. These stories often begin with two characters in an accident with each other or being targeted by the same malevolent entity, leading them to their soul swapping places. Screaming, panic, over exaggerated gender or personality characteristics, a male character touching the body of the female character he now resides in, and more are all incredibly common first reactions to the swap itself. What follows, usually, are the swapped characters seeking each other out. Assuming they weren't already in each other's presence, throwing accusations, and setting off to try to figure out how to swap back. When they almost inevitably can't figure it out in the first few hours, there is another moment of panic. The usually teenaged characters explain how to act in each other's homes and then sort of resign themselves for the rest of the day. Shenanigans ensue, of course. They meet up the next day and usually find at least a mildly better idea on how to revert their unfortunate circumstances. The rest of the work then follows them in the hijinks they get up to until things return to normal, which they usually do. These stories all tend to follow a、uh, quite similar structure. In fact, a lot of those narrative devices are all so common as to have become somewhat boilerplate. These tropish reactions and narrative beats are used as a sort of shorthand to signal to the audience directly what's happening and are often also played for some kind of laugh. <gasps> That's not to criticize these reactions or these character choices inherently, to be clear. I'm sure I'd shriek and become some weirdly hyper feminine version of myself if I was to randomly wake up in the body of a high school boy. Naya, Aru. If anything, this shorthand is a sort of testament to how popular body swapping narratives have become, having their own highly specific signals to serve as an almost second language for the audience. With that established, I now want to focus more on how body swapping functions as a narrative tool. That is a much more interesting conversation to me than just what it literally is. At the most surface level, body swapping as a narrative device explores the very common human emotions of wanting to be understood. A frequent ending takeaway for the characters involves them having seen how the other half lives or realizing the grass isn't always greener. It reinforces at a textual level the social expectations to accept your circumstances and make the most of your life, though it does so by forcing the characters squarely outside of their circumstances. It's by forcing empathetic situations that body swapping enables authentic empathy to grow. By making one character someone else, body swapping forces characters to understand others in order to be understood. At the same time, though thematically almost contrary, body swapping appeals in almost equal measure to the desire people have to escape themselves or to be someone else entirely. Victims of trauma, people struggling with identity or mental illness, or even just those suffering from poor circumstances are all predisposed in some capacity to wanting major change. It's with these two innate human feelings in mind that body swapping serves as a vehicle of intersectionality to explore many different aspects of identity. As put by the Syracuse University Libraries, intersectionality is the study of overlapping or intersecting social identities and related systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination. The theory suggests that and seeks to examine how various biological, social, and cultural categories such as gender, race, class, ability, sexual orientation, religion, caste, age, nationality, and other sectarian axes of identity interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels. That's a lot. 
I hate to be the person to cite from the dictionary, but dictionary.com does put it significantly more succinctly as the oppression and discrimination resulting from the overlap of an individual's various social identities. They specifically give the example of being a black woman, as being black and being a woman each result in unique experiences, but being both creates a unique though overlapping perspective. In academia, intersectionality focuses specifically on oppression and the way that marginalized identities are intrinsically linked to each other within that framework. No facet of a person can exist in isolation, nor should any one specific facet of identity at a structural level be viewed in isolation. To superimpose this very academic study of intersectionality onto pop media demands that some components be weighed less heavily or discarded for the purpose of cultural analysis. Namely, while individual characters and their various identities can serve as fictional examples of those identities on an individual level, the media itself rarely explores the structural implications of such identities. Instead, a lot of the works I'm going to be focusing on throughout this video have a very narrow field of view. While it wouldn't be impossible to extrapolate these stories into their broader, societally facing intersectional implications, I'm instead going to be focusing on what the coalescing of multiple identities means for the specific individual characters on a case-by-case -case basis. With my main focus being on the act of body swapping between two characters, I think a much more fruitful discussion would be to explore the way individuals with different identities swapping places creates compartmentalized examples of intersectional experiences. In fact, I'd go so far as to argue that without any major differences in identity between body swapping characters, there wouldn't be any story worth telling. Wouldn't it just be terribly boring to watch two characters identical to each other in circumstance swap places? Like, watching two teen girls of the same ethnicity, sexuality, economic status, ability, etc. swapping places would get boring as soon as the shock value of the body swap wears off, which would be almost immediately. An exchange of some aspect of identity or circumstance is basically necessary, and body swap authors know that. Body swapping narratives all tend to center, or at least flirt with, one central question of identity. How do you know who you are when you're literally someone else? Even further, what makes a person? Who are you at your core, and how do you know? I'd like to explore the way major body swapping works play with a few specific themes around identity. I'm specifically going to be focusing on how certain works explore gender, sexuality, class, family, ability, and social standing. There are dozens of works that utilize body swapping as a trope in some capacity, so it's kind of inevitable that I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them. With that said, barring three major exceptions, I'm more concerned with using the works to explore the way body swapping serves as a tool to understand identity and foster empathy, though through an existentialist lens, than I am the individual stories themselves. Of course, if there's interest in a further deep dive of any of the works that I don't give as much of a platform to, I'd be happy to follow this video up with a more focused analysis. Gender is an incredibly common facet of identity to focus on within Japanese body swapping stories. Works like Your Name, Inside Mari, Puberty Bitter Change, I Love Yuri and Got Body Swap with the Fujoshi, Corporate Slave and Gal Switch Places, Yamada Kun and the Seven Witches, and many, many more focus quite explicitly on the sex difference between the characters. In most works, like in I Love Yuri and Got Body Swap with the Fujoshi and Corporate Slave and Gal Switch Places, the gender bend of the body swap serves primarily to help the protagonist learn to view each other in a more human and less alien light. There are jokes, of course, with the male character soul being obsessed with having tits or seeing the girls changing in a locker room, but that's not the focus. Though with that said, I Love Yuri and Got Body Swapped with the Fujoshi flips that on its head a little bit with the girl's soul sexualizing the boy's body, but the intention is fairly similar. These kinds of body swaps are frequently light-hearted, dime-a-dozen explorations of fairly basic themes. The characters differ, of course, but what they learn about gender is usually pretty bog-standard. Women are people. Men don't always have it easy. It kinda sucks to be sexualized all the time, huh? Etc. Body swapping is employed as an act of empathy for gender. It's through experiencing a different gendered lens that the characters gain greater appreciation and understanding for a group they had previously viewed from a distance, and usually through stereotype. 
Works like Tama Chen center that empathy explicitly by having the same actions and attitudes be interpreted by the non-body swapping cast very differently depending on whether a boy or girl is doing it. An overwhelming majority of the body swaps that I've read and watched in preparation for this video center gender in some capacity between the body swapping characters. There's just, there's so much there. Every single person alive has had some gendered experience, either by choice or forced on them by those around them. Exploring the way characters can gain empathy for each other's gendered experiences can translate quite easily onto our own lives, encouraging us to have empathy for others and their gendered experiences. Experiences that most of us only ever see one side of. Class and social expectations are also frequently explored through body swapping, though not to the degree that I would like them to be. I'll explain why. The aforementioned corporate slave and gal switch places follows a worn down salary man, Enomoto, who's unable to stick up for himself, and a wealthy high school gyaru, Riko, who feels crushed by family expectations placed upon her. Gyaru, if you're unfamiliar, is a Japanese fashion subculture, but that's kind of beside the point. When the two switch places, they gain greater appreciation for each other's circumstances and what led to them. You might notice that these characters also have a gender component to their body swap, but I think a much more interesting way to explore this work is through the differences in their social standing. It is thanks to their body swap that these two are able to grow. Enomoto is able to learn to be assertive, future-oriented, and insistent about his needs. Diko is able to take control of her life and stop letting other people's expectations dictate her. With that said, I did say that I don't love the way that class is usually handled. Class and social expectations tend to be more toned down within body swapping. Unlike many other themes or aspects of identity that the trope tends to gravitate towards, namely gender, its focus on class is often very limited and highly specific to the individual characters, to a degree beyond the way identity usually is. That's not to say that nothing can be taken from the stories, Liko becoming insistent on choosing her own path and Inomoto finding more to his life than work are good lessons. The lessons just tend not to go very far. It's not particularly surprising that they don't, but I can't help but wish that they would. The way that body swapping stories tend to avoid the structural or the societal, except for where they influence the individuals that we're following, is seen kind of in no better way than through class. Questions targeting power structures themselves that create the conditions where the characters find themselves feeling dissatisfied are always white noise at best. No one fundamentally questions the positions of power that Rico's family hold and the way those lead to unfair social expectations. The work only rejects Rico being held to them, not the idea that people could have this power in a general sense. But I do think there are still lessons that we can get from these stories, and they do shine a light into the way that authors specifically tend to view ideas of class and differences in social standing between their characters. It's underbaked, but it could be worse. Disability is an underexplored element of body swapping, though serves a very interesting narrative purpose when it actually is employed. In This is Love But Not Love, high school girl Yatome Ren swaps bodies with Hidaka Manami, a sickly middle schooler. She's the little sister of Hidaka Yusei, a boy Ren's age who has a reputation for being a bit of a hard ass. Then, the protagonist and POV character of the story has empathy forced on her like the characters in other works, but instead of for a gendered experience or class, for disability. Manami is chronically ill, resulting in her need to be cared for by her older brother Yusei. She struggles with weakness, fainting spells, and bouts of fever. As someone who's chronically ill myself, it was honestly kind of captivating to see characters struggle with a very similar disability to my own. When Len and Monami have a chance to return to their own bodies, Monami refuses. While it's incredibly unfair for Ren to feel stuck with a disability that wasn't her own, that feeling in and of itself is a very common experience for disabled people. No one chooses or opts into disability, so could you really blame Manami for not wanting to go back? I wish that This Is Love But Not Love centered this discussion on disability more squarely than it does. When it explores it, it's incredibly captivating. Unfortunately, the actual reason Manami refuses to return to her body is not because of disability. It's... <sighs> It's because she's in love with her brother and wants to be able to get with him in a body that is not his sibling. 
Um, I'm not going to touch that. I shouldn't really need to say how disappointing it is that one of the few stories that actually centers disability is bogged down by a completely unnecessary incest plotline, but I have to acknowledge it. We're just going to move on. So far, we've looked at a few aspects of identity and how body swapping is able to explore them, but what if we went further and utilized body swapping to its fullest potential? What happens when a body swap forgoes any major gimmicks, instead taking the trope to its most extreme logical conclusion? What happens when the body swap is the narrative, when there's no curse, no weird tech gimmick, or no dreaming to blame? In Puberty Bitter Change, two elementary school children, Yui and Yutha, swap bodies when Yutha falls from a tree and bangs his head on Yui's. There's the same initial shock and horror, completely expected and common from the trope at this point, but the kids can't find a way to turn themselves back. They never do. Puberty Bitter Change explores what happens after the body swap. It's a two-pronged coming-of-age story, exploring a boy and a girl coming of age as each other. And thank God for that twist. I tend to hate most coming-of-age stories. Perhaps that's a bit reductive, but I genuinely do feel that way about most of the ones that I've been exposed to. A question I can't help but always get caught up on is who exactly is coming of age here? In high school, a teacher made me watch Stand By Me, a coming of age story based on a Stephen King novella. The story follows four boys who go on an adventure, find a dead body, and learn important life lessons along the way. It isn't a particularly noteworthy story, I don't think, even by coming-of-age standards, but I felt alone among my peers who watched it with me in not getting it, so to speak. I did get it, to be clear. I understood what it was going for, that wasn't particularly difficult. But I couldn't really bring myself to care. I rarely can when it comes to coming-of-age stories. I find that at best, coming-of-age narratives center the very specific experiences of their author in a near-autobiographical way, or at least capture the feeling of a common experience for their highly narrow intersectional identities. That's not like a problem, obviously, but it's truly difficult for me to get from the stories, emotionally speaking, whatever the creators seem desperate to convey to me. Stand By Me is about four fairly well-off white boys in the 1950s who experience a tragedy. What the movie intends, and what seemingly most people take from it, as the capturing of a universally relatable experience, just doesn't land for me. The supposedly universal feels wholly foreign. And that's been my experience with most coming-of-age media, even that which captures aspects of my own intersectionality more explicitly. I like works like The Miseducation of Cameron Post, Lady Bird, and The Perks of Being a Wallflower. All stories that more closely resemble aspects of my own identity, but I still don't get from it what others seem to. The exception to this rule for me, at least historically, has been Japanese media. Maybe because of its cultural context being different from my Western experience, I'm able to more easily capture the universality intended with its themes and symbolism. But maybe it's just the coincidence. Or, you know, maybe I just don't like Stephen King. Puberty Bitter Change is the most interesting coming-of-age story I've ever been exposed to, and I don't think it's really a competition. The inherent fish-out-of-water qualities of a body swap tied directly to the confusion of growing up serves as an in to the character's psyches, unlike anything available in another coming-of-age. The protagonists, Yui and Yuta, are uncomfortable with their incredibly strange circumstances and are having anything but a normal adolescent experience. It's through that incredibly foreign and unrelatable experience that the universality other coming-of-age stories fails to convey shines almost blindingly. Identity is centered more squarely in Puberty Bitter Change than the other body swaps I've mentioned so far. In most of them, the characters have some idea how to change back, or at least somewhat confident that the body swap won't be permanent. Yui and Yutha have no such confidence, at least not really. Everything they try fails. The story follows the two over more than a decade as they maintain an almost dogmatic insistence in preparing for themselves to swap back. They ritualistically meet in the playground to update each other on family and social relationships, seemingly convinced in the face of passing years that they'd of course eventually find a way to return to normal. They don't. Utah experiences Yui's first period, the complication and resolution of tensions within her family, and being treated by men as a sexual object. 
Huey experiences Utah's voice drop and his body grow, his younger brother growing up, and his first kiss. But are those really the other's experiences? Despite it originally being her body, Yui never experiences a period, being sexualized by men or being treated as a daughter by her parents. Yutha never experiences the kiss that Yui felt, his voice dropping or being a man. They identify with their original bodies for almost the entire run of the manga, but what in the face of a lifetime does that identity really mean? What happens when you come of age as someone else? Yui and Yuta spend the majority of their lives insistent on achieving a future that they refuse to let themselves acknowledge as unachievable. It takes until a near tragedy at the end of the manga for them to realize that the life they'd been chasing was actually the life they'd been living. They learn to value each other by living the experiences that built them. It was by being forced to understand the other that they themselves were finally truly understood by someone. It isn't clean, it isn't happy, and there's no bow to tie the coming-of-age body swap off. It's because of that, because of how messy and existential puberty bitter change is, that it's able to feel so honest. Not a soul on earth could relate to the specifics of their circumstances, regardless of their intersectionality. Yet Yui and Yuta's coming-of-age remains effortlessly relatable. A closely related trope to body swapping would be the gender bender, or as my anime list labels it, the magical sex shift. The trope itself is fairly straightforward. One character, often an adolescent boy, suddenly undergoes a total biological physical sex change, showing all external sex characteristics as if they were assigned a different gender at birth. This usually happens when the character wakes up one morning, though infrequently occurs while they're just doing something else. The trope has an incredibly rich body of work behind it, many of which are closely related thematically and functionally to body swapping. The major difference, obviously, is that there isn't a swapping of soul or personality. Even when multiple people are experiencing a magical sex shift at the same time, as seen in works like Tensei Pandemic, the individuals being affected are still within their own body. It isn't the inside that's changing, but the outside. The overlap in the way gender bender and body swap stories explore intersectional components of identity is quite obvious. Many body swap stories themselves include a degree of gender bending, so it isn't a surprise to see how these adjacent tropes influence each other. For instance, the creator of Onimai I'm Now Your Sister, Neko Tofu, credits Your Name, the most famous Japanese body swapping work that also happens to include gender bending, with inspiring Onimai. Onimai is decidedly not a body swapping narrative, though. Instead, like explained previously, it's a single character on the inside whose outside is changed. One soul, two bodies, as opposed to two souls, two bodies. <laughs> Gender bending magical sex shifts are deserving of a full video essay in their own right. <coughs> Ahem. But I felt I'd be remiss not to at least acknowledge them here. Like body swaps, magic sex shifts explores what it means to have an identity, though specifically through a gendered lens. Many members of the trans community cite magic sex shift stories, despite not explicitly being about trans characters most of the time, as being relatable and true in many ways to their experiences. I'd love to explore those intricacies in a more detailed follow-up video. However, this is already getting quite long. I'd like to finally talk about the big one. But first, we need some cultural context. Before we get into this section, I want to acknowledge that I studied Japanese for years, including for an extended period of time in Japan. However, I obviously am not perfect at speaking or history, nor am I Japanese by nationality. So while I consider myself to have a degree of expertise beyond most Westerners, I also wanted to rely on outside sources a bit more heavily in this section than others to ensure that any potential mistakes that I could make would be mitigated. Always defer to Japanese people if I make a mistake that they correct. With that said, Japanese society tends to be hierarchical in a way that's quite unfamiliar to most Westerners. Instead of the rigidly enforced roles people are born into, a la the Eurocentric understandings of social class, or even something like the caste system, Japanese hierarchy is quite ever-present in ways that are near wholly unfamiliar to many of us outside of Japan. I specifically want to draw attention to the way this is seen in language. Japanese has multiple forms of speech, but for the purpose of this discussion, I want to focus on the three primary umbrella sections of speech. Those would be casual speech, polite speech, and keiko, or very polite speech. These different forms of speech, at their most similar, frequently have different conjugations and declensions for the same words. 
at their most different, especially where Kegel, very polite speech, is concerned, entirely different words are also frequently used. What makes Japanese linguistic hierarchy quite unique, especially from a Western perspective, is the way it manages to constantly be both rigid and in constant flux. Let's say you were to walk into a convenience store in Japan. The clerk would almost certainly greet you very politely, using keigol. The expectation from you in that moment would be to respond either politely or casually, though specifically not with keigol, as you, as the customer, are higher in the social hierarchy in that moment. If you were to later be hired for a job at this convenience store, though, the same clerk would become a senior employee in relation to you. You would then be expected to speak to them politely, where they could choose to respond either casually or politely to you. Neither of you are using Kegel with each other at all. Instead, your use of Kegel would be saved for customers at the store or those significantly higher than you in the company, on more degrees than just seniority. That's just within one specific sliver of potential social interactions. Expectations for degrees of politeness within Kegel, polite speech, and casual speech vary between each individual relationship you have and the role that specific person holds at the time of your communication. This is all to say nothing of honorifics, so the way people refer to each other beyond explicit politeness. Anyone who's engaged in more than a passing way with Japanese media has probably been exposed to honorifics like san, sama, chan, and others. These honorifics are placed after a person's name or title and serve as both signs of respect and an acknowledgement of social expectation and hierarchy. It's a lot. I could go further with discussions of the family unit or the importance of reputation in Japanese society, how you're expected to serve as a constant representative of your family, school, work, etc. But I don't want to make this already too long section even longer. With all of this context in mind, imagine for a moment swapping bodies with somebody in Japan. The depth of understanding required to navigate every single facet of communication and social performance within a Japanese context is dizzying. This is on top of the most obvious things to worry about in the event of a sudden body swap. Gender, employment, school, relationships, how to pee, everything. Your relationships in this context are more than just how you act, but the literal language you use. It's a form of code switching far eclipsing what most Westerners would ever be expected to do, but constant and everywhere. Now that I've just spent however long explaining the most difficult culture shock aspects of Japan, let me now shift gears and argue that it's actually like not that bad. I say that half joking, but I specifically am referring to Japanese spirituality and folklore. It's quite different from Western, predominantly Christian-centric understandings of those ideas, yes, but it's actually not nearly as inaccessible or unfamiliar as many people might think. Many works of Japanese fiction that have gained substantial popularity in the West are steeped very deeply in Japanese folklore and spirituality. Look no further than the Ghibli films or The Legend of Zelda to see how strongly Japanese spirituality, especially Shinto, has permeated major works of fiction without alienating Western audiences. If you're a fan of Zelda in particular and would like to learn more about some of its expansive Shinto connections, I highly recommend Good Blood's incredible essay on Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time, a masterclass in subtext. And this is the first sorrow thread. The Shinto line. Spirituality and even religion as a whole means something very different outside of a Christian Western framework. It's no surprise, then, that the way spirituality or religious thought is incorporated into fiction is very different within a Japanese context than a Western one. This can be seen especially through your name. Yes, we are finally talking about your name. One of the highest grossing Japanese films of all time, your name is essentially the seminal body swapping work for many people, at least where anime and manga are concerned. Incredible artistic direction and production value aside, it's actually somewhat surprising just how popular your name became on a global scale. Even sidestepping the somewhat niche trope of body swapping, your name wears its Shinto and Japanese folklore influences very prominently on its sleeve, and not just aesthetically. Mitsuha, one of the protagonists of the film, is a Shinto priestess in training. The film spends a substantial portion of its runtime in or around a Shinto shrine, with Mitsuha's grandmother serving as a spiritual rock. Taki, a Tokyo high school boy, experiences a culture shock while in Mitsuha's body akin to that presumably felt by much of the audience. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Shinto is the Japanese ethnic religion that has coexisted on the island nation with Buddhism for millennia. 
Shinto is a polytheistic religion, centering deification, a nature focused on spirits and local deities and ancestral reverence. Many festivals, matsuri, originating from Shinto traditions are hosted throughout the year across Japan, as well as celebrations and holidays originating from other traditions that have been intertwined with Shinto throughout Japanese history, like Tanabata. From the beginning of the film, Mitsuha is seen engaging with kumihimo, or traditional Japanese braiding techniques. The film focuses specifically on the idea of kumihimo as musubi, the tying of knots, the act of connecting, beginning and ending. The Shinto influence on your name cannot be understated. As much as your name is a body swapping work, exploring themes the likes of which I've discussed all video, it is also a deeply spiritual homage to folklore and religion. Shinkai Makoto, director, writer, and producer of Your Name, credits The Changelings as a major inspiration for the movie. At least, common knowledge says that he does. The source on Wikipedia takes me to a listing for the official visual guide of Your Name, though it was unavailable for purchase and seemingly has not been uploaded to the internet anywhere as a digital copy. If you happen to have access to the official visual guide, please let me know as I would love to verify the claim. Regardless, though, the connection between the two, even if it is unintentional, is quite easy to see. The Changelings is a centuries-old classical Japanese story that follows a boy and a girl who are raised as each other. While the Changelings originally existed within a more explicitly Buddhist Japanese context, like most aspects of Japanese folklore, it's become something of a fusion with time. The Changelings is not a body swap in the ways we would recognize the trope today, though it explores themes of gender and station within its cultural context quite similarly. The focus of the Changelings on mannerism in particular can be seen mirrored quite explicitly within your name. Despite much of the writing on your name focusing on its body swapping, its actual use of the trope is much more reserved and limited when compared to many of the other works that I've discussed. Taki and Mitsuha don't stay in perpetual body swapping mode for the entire run of the film, and most of the daily life components of body swapping that other works seem to prioritize as a focus are instead either glossed over as a montage or not included at all. In your name, body swapping serves mostly as a tool for contrast and to set up the many spiritual themes of the film. Opposites are a near constant display. Masculine and feminine. City and nature. Secular and religious. Past and present waking in dreams. Body swapping is just one of the many ways opposites are highlighted to be twisted. Like in Puberty Bitter Change, your name asks, how better to learn about yourself than through the experiences of others? How better to highlight what you take for granted than to take it away? Positive and negative space. Twilight and dawn. Male and female. Musubi. Mitsuha and Taki are connected through their fates, commonly represented in East Asian folklore through a red string. Their souls are intertwined and forever tied to each other. Even when the brain forgets, or the meaning behind the act is lost, connections and the emotion behind the purpose are forever. <laughs> Opposites they may be, though like ropes of different colors, are tied together, interlaced, and made into something beautiful and joined. Musubi. Your name plays with time, and what it means not just to be connected to another, but to be rooted in yourself. Assurance cannot be seen except in the shadow of doubt. The opposites themselves are not what it finds interesting but the colors that are made or the lines begin to blur. The past is a state of constant ending. Memories like dreams that fade far too quickly when we finally wake up. To know who you are, you must know who you're connected to. Twilight preceding dawn. A simple red thread. Connection. Dreaming. (sighs) 
مثل بی This all brings me, finally, to Inside Mahdi, a body swap like any other, only worse. Or so it starts. Komori Isao, a withdrawn 21-year-old college dropout, has been wasting away his life for three years. He stays inside every day to jerk off and play video games, only leaving in the evening to go to a convenience store. It's there, every night at 9pm, he sees a beautiful high school girl. He doesn't talk to her, God forbid, but he thinks of her in his head as the angel from the convenience store. One night, as Komori is stalking this high school girl on her way home, a habit he'd already developed by the time the story began, she suddenly turns around and smiles at him. The next thing he knows, he wakes up in an unfamiliar room. Komori is in the body of 16-year-old girl Yoshizaki Mari. Komori is slower than most male characters waking up inside the body of a woman to take explicit advantage of her. In fact, he's determined not to even touch or look at Mari beyond what's absolutely necessary to function until he can get her permission. He's in love with her, after all. This girl, five years his junior, who he'd never even spoken to before. As such, Komori decides to make contact with himself, his body, that is, as soon as possible. He goes to the convenience store, to where he knows Mari frequently comes, and hopes to find her inside of his body. He sees himself physically, as expected, though something's wrong. The man in the convenience store has no idea what Komori is talking about. Komori is inside Mari, but Mari is not inside Komori. Real fast, I am about to spoil the hell out of Inside Mari to explain what it does so differently. If any part of you wants to read Inside Mari even a little bit, please do so before watching the rest of this video. It's available through Crunchyroll's manga selection if you have premium, as well as being sold physically in English in most Barnes & Noble manga sections. I'm sure there are other ways to read it as well, but I'm not going to recommend any in particular. I don't think the story will be ruined for you if you choose to watch anyway. In fact, you may respect what it's doing quite a bit more from the jump, but the suspense of the manga will absolutely be dampened. Proceed at your own risk. Mari is not inside of Komori because Komori is not actually inside Mari. There isn't a body swap. Inside Mari is an example of a trope deconstruction. Put simply, to deconstruct a trope or a genre is to break it down to its most fundamental parts, expose what it does and how it does it, and then use those pieces to twist it into something new. Inside Mari wears the rotting skin of a body swap to deliver a heartbreaking narrative on trauma, identity, and purpose. Fundamentally, Inside Mari seems mostly focused on the identity component, for the protagonist as much as for the author, Oshimi Shuzo. The girl known as Mari was a victim of neglect, abuse, and terribly unfair social expectations. She was belittled by her mother, neglected by her pushover father, and was taught quite clearly from a young age that compliance was key. It did not matter what she was or how she acted, so long as it was exactly what the people around her desired. Mari was not a person. She wasn't allowed to be. She was a mirror. Whatever her parents wanted was what she did. What her friends expected of her is how she would act. Nothing was left for her. Hell, Mari wasn't even her name at birth. Her mother changed it to Mari when she was a toddler to spite her recently deceased mother-in-law, erasing the identity that Mari had literally been born with. When Mari just happened to spot Komori through a window sometime before the story started, she wasn't repulsed by his living in trash, his jerking off all day, or his lack of any friends, hobbies, or job. The opposite, in fact. She envied him. There was a man able to be so unconcerned with social expectations as to forego everything. Whatever hedonistic impulse Komori had, he could engage free from any repercussions. And he did. Mari quickly realized the extent of Komori's freedom, since she was actually the one stalking him before the story began. After all, how could Mari, who had been afforded nothing, not envy him? Mari's struggles are mirrored quite explicitly by Oshimi, the author, in the manga afterwards. Volume 1 ends with Oshimi declaring his desire to become a woman, quote, in both body and mind. 
He said his desire in creating the manga was to, quote, venture into that half of the world he couldn't reach. Oshimi is somewhat notorious for his uh, honest confessions in manga afterwards. His most recent work at time of recording, Welcome Back Alice, includes admissions of confusion around his gender and sexuality, accompanied by uh, gr- graphic descriptions of his own body throughout the entire run. It's not surprising, then, that a man so troubled by his own identity, purpose, gender, and sexuality would craft a body-swapping narrative with all of those themes at the forefront. Mari, like Oshimi, is not afforded the freedom to explore her identity. She isn't afforded an identity at all. So she snaps. Whether it's psychosis, trauma-induced association, or just desperation, it doesn't really matter. Mari believes wholeheartedly that she is Komori. She believes that she is a man with the freedom to pursue his interests. A man free to be perverse and disgusting. A man with the freedom to choose how he lives according to no one's terms but his own. The komori that Mari envied was not inside of her, but a komori certainly was. A komori of her own creation. A komori that gave her an outlet. A komori that gave her an identity. Body-swapping narratives all tend to center, or at least flirt with, one central question of identity. How do you know who you are when you're literally someone else? It's through someone else, someone else of her own mind, that Madi is able to find herself. Body swapping demands the exchange of soul or psyche, and though Madi never left, Komori was brought in. It may not be literal body swapping, but it certainly deconstructs it. Inside Madi could not exist were it not for the established framework to smash. Without body swapping, even though no one else was actually involved, there wouldn't have been a Mari to find. At the very end of Inside Mari's last volume, Oshimi writes a final thank you note to the reader. Quote, In the afterword for volume one, I wrote that I want to be a woman, but I don't want to become a woman anymore. While creating this manga, I found the woman inside of me. I found the man inside the woman, the beauty inside the ugliness, and the reality inside the fantasy. I hope there are no boundaries inside of you. Thank you for reading this. Osimi Suzo. Body swapping is about identity and empathy, and it's existential as hell. It's terrifying to consider what you might do if you were to wake up as someone else entirely. It's almost equally scary to think what someone else might do with your body while you're not in it. But still, by being in someone else's head, we learn not only about what made them, but what made us. How do you know who you are while you're literally someone else? I don't actually know if that's the question I should be asking. None of us can know how we'd react, and we will almost certainly never experience a body swap in real life. Fiction can enlighten us to possibilities, but where we take those possibilities is far more important in the long run. Most of us will never be someone else, though that doesn't mean we can't change or even blossom more clearly into ourselves. In the end, I think a more direct question would be far more poignant, though a bit uncomfortable. How do you know who you are now? Thank you for watching.